I just wanted to remind you that at the American Bandito website, we now have a store page. So if you'd like to support the show, and if you've been enjoying it this season, head on over to AmericanBandito.com and visit the store section. We've got stickers and books and shirts, things like that. So if you uh, would like to support the show, stop on by, get yourself something. So go to AmericanBandito.com and visit the store section. And I want to thank you so much for listening to this show. I hope you are enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying doing it. All right, enough of that. Now, on to the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. Let's begin with another pop-up interview that I did from my booth that I had this year at Plan B. My name is Heather Rabada. I'm a painter and a writer, and I'm a Madison native of 20 years. So you paint and you write. So what's the, the style in which you do it? Well, I'm a work in progress, but I've done acrylics and canvas and had some luck with that. And I started out like trying to think that I was Jackson Pollock, but none of those turned out I used too much paint. I used house paint. Okay and long rolls of canvases and then started to reel it in and now I do you'd think they were self-portraits but I don't have anything else to look at so I paint my face but male and female and um, I have one called The Saint which has only about three colors it's flesh tone, it's red and it's like sage green Well with the Jackson Pollock thing like are they large pieces? They were large pieces and I just I just felt like that was part of the process to get the creativity out, to hone it into something that was actually um, useful in some way. And I'll probably never paint like that again. And I I respect people who paint like that because they do it and they make it look good. And mine was just like eggplant purple, green, like neon green, and some colors that just weren't right. But but now I, I really work with color and I like reds with greens and pinks with greens and I think people might think I'm colorblind when they look at my art but you know I I just like it it's fun. Well what's your background in it like how did you get started? I always had art classes in junior high and high school but I had this one guy who was my inspiration in my high school class who now illustrates for Spongebob Squarepants. Carson if you're listening you're (laughs) awesome. I hope he is listening, actually. (laughs) So do I. (laughs) Today on the show, I talked to someone that runs a place that I've been curious about for quite some time. Jerry Chernow. I'm a uh, partner here at Lakeside Printing Cooperative. I've driven by the Lakeside Press for years, and the outside is covered with flyers and, and just scattered prints of things outside, and I've always wondered what goes on inside of there. And truthfully, I was a little surprised. I didn't know if they did screen printing, but over the years it's kind of evolved and the history of how the place came about was way more fascinating than anything I would have thought of. I know from your website, you guys have been around since 81, I think it says. So how how did it all begin? I was part of a printing collective in Chicago in the 70s called Omega Graphics. I moved up to Madison for a couple of reasons, health reasons, and also because I had some land in Richland County I wanted to be closer to. So I started Lakeside Press at that time as a one-person operation. But when it got um, too big for me to handle by myself, I didn't want to be a boss. So, <laughs> so we, turned, we turned it into a partnership. Okay. You know, and I worked with first one other person and then a couple other people. And then eventually we decided to incorporate as a worker cooperative, which is pretty much the same as a partnership, but it, it's a little more formal. What made you uh, decide to go into printing to begin with? I had been working at a, a Quaker Center, actually in Chicago, called the American Friends Service Committee. We did all our printing down the street at this little print, printing, pol- political print shop. Okay. I did all our printing, and I got to be pretty friendly with the guy who was running it all by himself. Did they have a, not a ditto machine, but like one of those things where it would just like be the spindle that you did that? Or like, how were they no, doing they their printing? a real press. It was okay. called the Multilith Press. He would run it to odd hours. You know, he'd come in and run things whenever he felt like it, pretty much. <laughs> That's uh, nice. But he got everything done. So, you know, it seemed pretty interesting to me. And basically what happened is I got tired of, I was doing bookkeeping at, for the Quakers and it was very simple, and uh, I got kind of tired of it after a while. <laughs> Somebody suggested to me, you know, Bob down the street is is wanting to move out of town. His father had taken ill. 
he wanted to move back east to help take care of him. Okay. And he's, so he was looking for someone or someones to take over the shop. Well, it just so happened that a good friend of mine was taking printing courses in Chicago right. and would come, come by you know, like a couple times a week and show me what he had printed up and was, he was really proud of it. You know, his, his, his yeah. ability to produce printed material. What kind of stuff was he printing? You know, like business cards, you know, announcement type things, you know, nothing too fancy. Yeah, you know, they, they looked nice, you know. And, uh, you know, it's something he created, you know. Yeah. I said to him, hey, Rich, you know, Bob wants to leave town. Would you, you know, and he's looking for somebody to take over the shop. Yeah. And I'm tired of working here. Uh, and uh, Rich was just about done with his his uh, classes. So we went to this guy, Bob, the print, Bob the printer, and said, well, you know, we're kind of interested. And he said, oh. That would be great, but maybe talk to your friend David, who was also a very close friend of mine, who had just was in between jobs at the time. But uh, he said, yeah, David has been a big supporter of this shop. He lent me money when we were tight, and mm -hmm. he was always interested in uh, learning printing. So he said, maybe he would be willing to go in with you, too. And he was, like, overjoyed when he found out about it. Yeah. So the three of us took over the shop. Okay. This little print shop, Omega Graphics, in uh, 1974. Okay. We just had a great time working. Uh, Rich can only come in. Uh, he, he still had some classes, so he can only come in after school. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly me and David doing the day-to-day -day stuff. Okay. But we had a great time doing it. Yeah, we made a little money, actually, on it. So only one person really had a background in printing. Like, you had worked with the guy, had stuff printed by him. But you didn't necessarily run no, anything. I had no printing experience, but I'd had business experience. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Like, okay, you got this printing shop, then what? We had, um, David had great contacts. He lived in Hyde Park in Chicago, and he knew everybody down there, okay. especially in the nonprofits. Those were, you know, those became our, our key customers. All right. Plus various uh, peace and justice groups that we were both part of. So we drew in a lot of work. We had a big stock of graphics that we can add to people's posters. Oh. So like the clip art that people know now that yeah. they can just search for yeah. is you had that, that on hand. Sort of iconic clip art for the political customers. Right, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we just kind of, actually Bob had been collecting them for years and he just turned them over to us. How did you go about making the prints? I mean, there's screen print, there's so many different there's forms different of printing. Kinds of printing. Ours was called photo offset printing. And the idea is somebody brings in their job, either they have it all fleshed out on paper or they just have a mock-up of what they want. If they have a mock-up, then we have to create the type and lay out based on their design, their, you know, their instructions. And those days, a lot of times it was press type. <laughs> if you remember back that far, kind of rub on letters. Later on, we started to get into computer graphics kind of things. Around when did you start doing that? 79, 80, really? something like that. I didn't know. I, I was See, I was curious, like, when did computer graphics and yeah, printing start starting, to melt? Starting to happen. Okay. The old Commodore uh, computers <laughs> in <laughs> right. those days. Other times we just used, like, a Selectric typewriter, you know? You would then create a copy of the electric typewriter, or you would use... Use the, the typewriter to create the type that, you know, somebody might just handwrite hand letter what they want a poster to, to say okay. and they say make it look good you know so, so somehow we have to create the type uh -huh. to go in there we're just not going to use their handwritten lettering you said you did some protest stuff it was omega graphics in chicago and the omega comes from draft resistance omega is the, the in the physics is a symbol for resistance okay so the draft resistance movement used the omega symbol as a symbol of draft resistance. And we called our shop Omega Graphics mm -hmm. because it started out from the Chicago area draft resistors. You know, it was a project of theirs. The connection of printing and protest in the resistance movement, that it always seems to be kind of connected. This goes back to the days of Tom Paine, he, maybe further than that. Yeah. I mean, where he became a printer because he had all these radical ideas that he wanted to get out there, mm. and uh, the regular printers wouldn't touch it. 
Okay. We found that even in our little shop, we came up with this idea. Actually, Bob came up with this idea of uh, a little pamphlet that was entitled The Rights of a High School Student. Uh-huh. And you open it up and every page was blank. <laughs> <laughs> the commercial printers wouldn't touch it. They didn't want to deal with it. Huh. So, well, we printed it ourselves. You said before they'd give you handwritten type. What would you do if they gave you a drawing and go, I want this on yeah, there the with drawing. it? Yeah. The drawing, we, we can um, make a photo, photograph of. And eventually, I was saying we were photo, uh, photo offset. The idea is you take whatever they got when it's ready to print. It, it, maybe, maybe there's two different pieces that have to get fitted together, like a drawing and type. Mm-hmm. You put it on our big graphic arts camera. It used to go through the wall kind of a camera. Oh, wow. And okay. it's a huge thing. They would spit out film negative for you. We take the film negative, or two film negatives maybe, crop those onto these lined sheets where we want them to print on a, on a page. Mm-hmm. We'd have these uh, grids. We'd tape them on there and get them lined up with a light table. We'd line them up exactly how we want them to be, cut out little windows for all the parts that we wanted to print. Okay. Because the idea is we would then take a bright light source, shine it through the, the negative. And of course, where negative is black, it won't go through. Mm-hmm. But the clear space is where the type is because it, it reverses when you take a negative. So the type and the images all become clear. The light comes through the clear space, burns an image onto a printing plate. That's okay. That's why it's photo offset, a bright light source burning the image onto a, a pre-sensitized aluminum sheath. So then you go to press it, you just have, what, have this big stamp that just goes punk, 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 or how? No, little pinholes at the top and the bottom of these sheets, yeah. and they wrapped around the cylinder, the impression cylinder on the press. Turn it on, and the cylinders go around and round, gotcha. and then the paper comes through. I've seen the cylinder go around, and I'm like, how in the hell do they get the thing on there? And yeah. you're saying that you just bend it around there because, oh, duh. Like, now that I think of it, it's like, it yeah. makes it so simple. Now hardly anybody does it. Now everybody <laughs> does computer to print. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of printing are you guys doing here today? That's what we're doing now. We're doing computer to print. Ralph creates stuff on the computer. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, it's ready to go. We press a button, and there it goes to our, <laughs> our fancy digital copier. Really high-quality stuff, which we never could do on the old presses. Then, okay, so you, you were doing that in Chicago, yeah. and then uh, you decided to move. Now, how did you try to move? I was owed some uh, back payroll money by the shop. And we decided, mutually decided, in lieu of me taking my back pay, I would take one of their presses. They had an extra press sitting around because they had just got a new one. So I took one of their small presses, it's called a multilith. It, it does up to 11 by 17 size sheets. So that was, you know, and that's the biggest I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I, I took the press on a truck. A friend of mine was a truck driver for a food co-op in Chicago. <laughs> and we just loaded it onto his truck. I had some other smaller equipment also. A stitcher, a wire stitcher similar to the one we have now. We had a uh, equipment dealer right next door to us. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this is all old printer's row in Chicago. Everything in the neighborhood was printing. Oh. It's funny, they call the condo printer's row condominiums, <laughs> but there's no printers there. <laughs> now, was it just you or did you bring it one of me initially? And my idea was to create something similar to what we had in Chicago. And initially I was right by Lake, Lake Monona. So a friend of mine who was helping me to move, you know, we were kind of moving stuff in and there was a window that looked right on, over the lake And we're both from Chicago, right? Yeah. The biggest print shop in Chicago at the time was the Lakeside Press, R.R. Donnelly's, the Lakeside Press, Mm -hmm. which does Time Magazine. And uh, so this is kind of a joke, you know, our shop, I figured the proportion was about the same. Our shop was to R.R. Donnelly's Lakeside Press. 
as Lake Monona is to Lake Michigan. <laughs> so it was called the place Lake Side Press. Mm-hmm. That's where the name came from. So how did you get set up and actually establish yourself here? Most of my business was here in the Bowie Street neighborhood. Mm. Plus, the heating was very poor in that building. Mm. So in the winter time, I was freezing. And not only was I freezing, but but the ink on the press was freezing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not good. So... Uh, so then I got an offer to move into the basement of Nature's Bakery down the street here until Nature's Bakery, which owned the building, found out that there was asbestos in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> so they wanted, they, they wanted to move everybody out, move us out, and then just a big, you know, tearing out all the asbestos. And uh, mm. so they brought in a company to do it with the masks and all that business. So we had to find another space. So we moved into another warehouse just a block away, which is now some fancy something or other in there. But at the time, it was kind of a funky old warehouse. Yeah. And uh, they gave us very cheap rent over there for time. But he was just subletting the place from the owner, and he hadn't been paying his rent. The guy who knew the guy. The guy who was... they subletting to us, so we had to get out of there. Then the next place we moved into was across the street here. But uh, we heard that um, St. Vincent de Paul, which is right across the street here, was wanting to buy that, and they actually bought quite a few properties on the street here. So, you know, the, the handwriting was on the wall that we weren't going to have that space for long. Yeah. So then we looked around to see if we... We were doing pretty well by that time financially, so we looked around to see if there was any place we can buy in the neighborhood. And this is what came up, this okay. building here. So we did that, I think it was in 1990 or 91. You'd been moving around that long? Yeah, wow. yeah. So then we bought this place, eventually paid off the mortgage. Just, uh, what was it, two years ago, we decided to sell the building, you know, that. Times are tough for small printers now. There's a lot of this paperless movement going on. Okay. People are doing online newsletters instead of printed newsletters. So it's a very tough time for especially for small print jobs. So we're struggling we're struggling here as well. Yeah, you know, we have like three floors in this building. Yeah. We'd rented out the top spaces as uh tenants. We rented out the basement to a guy who was a paleontologist. He put, he, uh, every summer he goes out and digs up dinosaur bones. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so guy walks in and goes, hey, I'm a paleontologist, you renting? He was a friend of one of the guys who was working here. Or actually, two of the guys who were working here. Yeah. They had been in the same class with him, the geology class at the University of Wisconsin. Okay. And this guy liked it so much, his geology class, he decided to go into that for a living mm-hmm. as a paleontologist. Every summer he goes out and digs up dinosaur bones and he hit it big time a few years ago. He got a, quite a few uh, T-Rex bones. Really? Which is like, you know, the mother load for, yeah. for paleontologists. <laughs> <laughs> Took a long time, but he finally sell, sold it. I think it was to a museum or a university, I can't remember which now. Okay. He's got this huge equipment down in the basement here. When he heard that we were struggling, Mm -hmm. he was afraid that we might lose the building or sell the building. He didn't want to have to move. So he offered to buy the building from us, pay us market rate for it. So that's what we did. So we got all this influx of cash and he's got the security of the building. And then he just rented the space back to us. So we're now a renter in this space. Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, we're old friends. So, you know, yeah, he had helped us for years. He's a very handy guy, you know, and he he would help us with the uh, if there were like plumbing problems in the in the uh, apartments upstairs or whatever. You know, a lot of times he was able to to fix things. Dinosaurs, freaking dinosaurs! That's crazy. Next week on the show, I meet a woman who tells me that she has embroidered almost every single scene from the movie The Shining. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. Until next time, so long.